Okay, then I'll get started. So thank you for your waiting. And I see all the friends here in person and also online. And uh, I appreciate everyone's attendance here. Um, so hello everyone, I'm Minghan Zhu. And uh, today I'll be defending my thesis titled Equivariant and Geometry Aware 3D Perception for Robots and Automated Driving. My dissertation committee includes Professor Hui Peng, Professor Mani Gaffari, Professor Ryan Eustace, Professor David Falke, and Professor Ron Basudaban. Three D perception is an essential task in a lot of robotic applications. Um, some examples include object manipulation, indoor navigation, and autonomous driving. In all these tasks, 3D perception enables the robot to understand the 3D environment and to interact with the 3D real world. Therefore, compared with um, general computer vision tasks, robotic 3D perception tasks have two features. First is safety critical. The second is resource sensitive because errors can have catastrophic, catastrophic outcome and there are usually limited computational power on board. Accordingly, this proposes two requirements on the robotic 3D perception algorithms, that is to be reliable and to be efficient. How do we achieve this? There are enormous variations in the environment and it makes it a very challenging problem. For example, here we show an, um, a several visualizations of an object data set, an indoor environment data set, and an autonomous driving data set. We can see that the variations in our real world is huge. So to deal with this challenge, a very popular solution is to scale up, to develop larger models and to train with more data. And the idea of big models and data have been very uh, increasingly popular, especially with the su their success in test and image generation. Here is a figure showing the size of the data sets used in language models developed over the past 30 years. We can see that this, their sizes are growing, rap growing rapidly and they are approaching 10 to the power of 12 recently. And for vision models, their sizes are smaller, um, approaching about 10 to the power of 10. Uh, but we can see that they are also growing very rapidly. What about 3D models? The largest, if we uh, visualize them in the figure of the vision, the largest 3D object data set is about here, uh, in this, uh, as this uh, yellow star. This is the object verse Objectverse XL data set released just a few days ago, and it contains about 10 million of objects. And it is even a synthetic data set. If we consider a real world object data set, the largest one is probably here, the CO3 data set with about tens of thousands of objects. And for autonomous driving, uh, a very popular one is Nuisance, and it contains 40,000 annotated frames. So their scale is similar. Actually, most 3D data sets today are around the scale of this line, about tens of thousands of annotated um, targets or frames. So um, why is that? We can see that they are of a much smaller scale than the uh, language and vision models or data sets. And the reason is that collecting and annotating 3D data is much more challenging than vision and uh, language data. So we can see that it is extremely hard to scale out 3D data. And even if we can, it is not really addressing the challenge of efficiency. So um, in this thesis, we will be focusing on another um, idea or strategy that is to going downwards to specifically, we reduce the sampling space using symmetry or equivalence classes. According to David George Kendall, a influential uh, mathematician and statistician in 20th century, shape is the geometry of an object, modular position, orientation, and scale. It means that if we can filter out the variations caused by these transformations, 
we can we can deal with much a much smaller space of data. Let's take uh, for example, let's consider all variations of chairs, and uh, in this scenario, we can say one one single chair in all the different poses form an equivalence class or a symmetry. So if a network can automatically generalize over this equivalence classes, we can we can be only dealing with a quotient space of these two, which is of a much smaller size. And the tool to realize it is equivariant learning. What is equivariance? Equivariance is a property of a function that preserves the symmetry to the group of transformations G. It can be represented as the commutativeness between the function and the transformations. For example, CNNs, convolutional neural networks, are translation equivariant. Given an image, if we first translate the image and then pipe it through a uh, convolutional feature extractor, the result is equivalent to the case if we directly use the network to extract features from the original image and then translate the feature map. So this property allows CNNs to automatically generalize over translations, which is the major reason of the huge success of CNNs in the past years. And equivariant networks extend the equivariance beyond translations. For example, SO2, SO3, those are 2D and 3D rotations. SE2, SE3 are the 2D and 3D rigid body transformations, including translations and rotations. Here is an uh, example of SO2 equivariance. We can see that uh, when the aerial image is rotated in the image plane, the output feature map also rotates accordingly. And their content, the features, are actually the same if we stabilize the view. So in this thesis, we'll be exploring the development of better equivariant models and their applications in various 3D perception problems. Three of these problems are point cloud-based tasks. And the last one is an image-based problem. The overall direction is to extend to more general symmetries and apply them to more practical tasks. So let's get into the first part, SO3 equivariant object registration. We first briefly introduce the task. The registration task is to find the transformation that best aligns two point clouds. A typical approach is to find corresponding point pairs and minimize their distance. However, it is not that straightforward to find correspondence due to challenges including sparsity of the input point clouds, the large initial pulse error, and a small overlap between the pair of point clouds. Therefore, we went for a correspondence-free strategy. Our algorithm is not relying on point correspondences, and it is independent of the initial post error. How do we realize this? The overall idea is by leveraging an SO3 equivariant feature extractor. The learned feature space carries the same transformation as the input space. Therefore, we transform the problem of registering to point clouds into a problem of registration of the deep features. The SO3 equivariant encoder is realized using vector neurons. Um, briefly speaking, it is a generalization of point net from scalar features to vector features. Given a point cloud of the shape n by 3, the output feature is of, of a shape c by 3, where c is the feature dimension. And this network has two important properties. First is rotation equivariant. Given the input point cloud with the rotation, the alpha feature map rotates accordingly with the same rotation matrix R. And it is also permutation invariant, meaning that the feature map, the output feature does not change when the input points are permuted. In this case, let's say, let's see if we have two point clouds P and Q, and Q is a rotated version of P with permutation. Then their output features FP and FQ will be related by a single rot uh, rotation matrix R. Therefore, 
We can actually solve for the optimal rotation R by directly using the SVD between the two feature matrices. And in practice, the point clouds P and Q can be corrupted by noise. Therefore, we also train an occupancy decoder so that the learned features better represents the underlying shape and so that they can be more robust to the noise in the input. We conducted experiments on the model at 40 data set, which contains about 12,000 CAT models from 40 categories of objects. We compare our method with several existing correspondence-free registration method in the literature. And as shown in the figure, regardless of the initial rotation uh, error, which is showing the horizontal axis, our method yields accurate registration result, thanks to the closed form solution in the equivariant feature space. However, our method also has a limitation. That is, this model is not translation equivariant. Therefore, the centers of the object needs to be aligned first before solving for the rotation. It motivates us to build an SE3 equivariant network to deal with the translations, which brings us to the next part. Efficient SE3 equivariant point convolution, or E2PN. We're all familiar with CNNs, so let's start with it. CNNs, for CNNs, the input and kernels are both functions over Rn, the Euclidean space. And then the convolution is also integration over the Euclidean space. The output function, the same, is a function defined over the Rn uh, space. And such a convolutional network, convolution layer is equivalent to the uh, Euclidean, uh, the translations in the Euclidean space. Therefore, it is a good starting point to realize SE3 equivariance. And group convolution as a representative SE3 equivariant network it's a generalization over the conventional convolution by lifting the domain from Rn, the Euclidean space, to the group space, which we denote as G here. We can see that the input function F, the kernel function kappa, and the convolution operation, the output function, are all defined now on the group space. And this is the main difference between group convolution and conventional convolution. And group here basically represents the set of transformations we're interested in. For example, Rn can be viewed as a group as well as the group of translations. And SO2, SO3, or SE2, SE3, as we mentioned before, the rotations and rigid body transformations are also groups. So we say that group convolution mainly, the mainly different from uh, conventional convolution by the domain lifting. So let's take a close look at the domain lifting. Here is an illustration. On this, in this figure on the left are the regular CNs, and on the right are group CNs. For a regular CN, an element can be identified as a point in the Euclidean space. And the convolution is basically a, um, get to gather information from all the nearby points. And for group CNs, because of the domain lifting. Now, at a single point in the Euclidean space, it is also coupled with a set of orientations. Therefore, when we conduct the convolution at this point, there will, it will involve much more connections with nearby points and all their orientations. And we can see that while this domain lifting enabled the equivalence to a broader uh, space, it also incurs significantly more computational cost. Therefore, our method goes with the strategy of quotient space convolution. Basically, the difference between this and group convolution is also about the domain. Now we are lifting the domain to a quotient space. The quotient space here we're denoted with G over H, where H is the subspace, is the subspace of G. We will explain in more details what the quotient spaces are in the next few slides. But the main idea here is that the size of a quotient space is typically much smaller than the group space. And this is the main reason that we can achieve much better efficiency. 
In our case, the G, the groove, is SO3 times R3, and the H, the subgroup, we are choosing SO2, the planar rotations. And the quotient space G over H is S2, which is the unit sphere times R3. Here we show a more detailed illustration. For SO3, one element in the SO3 group can be identified as a point on a unit sphere coupled with a rotation around an axis pointing through that point. And for the S2 space, an element is basically just a point on the unit sphere. And in practice, we are working with a uh, discretization of the groups, so which, which can be uh, visualized as a polyhedron. And in this case, the SO3, the discretized SO3, each element can be identified as a point, as a vertex of the polyhedron, and an orientation among the edges connecting the vertex. And for the quotient space S2, the discret disc in the discretized group, each element is simply just a vertex of the polyhedron. And we can see that the quotient space has a much smaller size than the polyhedron, uh, polyhedral rotation group SO3. Here it is 12 versus 16. So it's one fifth of the size, which can bring us huge efficiency improvement. Now you may wonder, does it come with the cost? We are working with a much smaller feature space. So does it reduce the ability for the feature representation? Actually, the answer is no. Actually, we can recover each of the SO3 group elements from this S2 feature maps. The reason is that, now the reason is that, the reason is shown in this figure. Let's say um, here in this polyhedron, every vertex representing the represents an elements in the S2 space is colored differently. So we can view them as different entities now. And if we put them together in a certain order, for example, uh, from top to bottom and go uh, in the clockwise, then we will have a permutation of all the uh, vertices. Now, every rotation applied on this polyhedron will result in a different permutation of these 12 vertices. Therefore, we can identify, for example, all these 60 rotations from these 12 elements by stacking them together in different permutations. Therefore, um, our method, while it's more efficient, it does not sacrifice the ability to distinguish all the rotations in the SL3 group that we're interested in. Here, we show uh, our experimental results. We conduct experiments in two data sets, one is more than 40, which is an object data set with 3D CAT models, and a 3D mesh data set, which is a data set with real world scans of uh, indoor scenarios. And we are conducting three tasks on these two data sets. One is object pose estimation, object classification, and P point matching in the indoor scenario patches. And we compare our method with EPN, which is an SE3 equivalent group CNN. Uh, network for point cloud processing. And here in this figure, we show the numbers for the memory consumption and speed, and the numbers before and after the slash are for training and inference separately. We can see that our method drastically reduced the computational cost. It only costs a fraction of the memory in both training and inference, and it also runs multiple times faster than the baseline. And at the meantime, our method achieved similar or even slightly better performance than the uh, baseline uh, results, which I didn't show the table here. So in conclusion, we proposed a new SE3 equivalent convolutional structure, E2PN, for point cloud learning. It is fast, memory efficient, and with a simple structure. So it is easier to incorporate with conventional com uh, point cloud networks compared with other equivalent models. And we believe that this work can promote equivalent learning in more practical 3D perception tasks. Actually, we've already made some progresses. Here, our lab mate, Chen Erling, 
has successfully developed a SE3 point cloud-based place recognition method on top of this network. And we are also collaborating on a point cloud registration model on top of it. And in the next chapter, I will introduce you an application of this, uh, of this network on a large scale LiDAR based uh, segmentation task. So here comes the third part, which is titled SE2 Equivalent LiDAR Scene Segmentation. So the task officially, the name is actually 40 panoptic LiDAR segmentation. It is a combination of semantic segmentation, instance segmentation, and object tracking. It takes a few LiDAR scans, a few sequential LiDAR scans together as an input, and an output per point semantic class and a temporally consistent per point instance ID. Here is a visualization of this task. You can see the different colors for different objects, and it is consistent across time for different instances. And compared with previously mentioned problems, this task is different in the following way. First, it is a multitask problem. It involves segmentic segmentation, instance segmentation, and tracking in a single network. And the input size for the, this task is pretty large. It involves tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of points as the input. And the output is this. It outputs per point label instead of a single label for a whole point count. Therefore, this task has, more, has some significant application value. And because we are working uh, with driving scenario in this task, so we can actually work with SE2 symmetry because most transformations in the driving scenario happens in the ground plane. And as for SO2, their discretizations are the cyclic groups with n elements. For example, C3, the cyclic group of three elements, is the set of can be regarded as the set of 120 degree rotations. And we'll, we will be working with these cyclic groups in our model. Here is an overview of the network. Uh, without going into all the details, this network can actually be abstracted as these few blocks. First, the um, sequential light scans are aggregated together as a single input uh, to the network. And then we have an S, um, SA2 equivariant feature extractor to learn the equivariant features from the point cloud. And here we are using the Ethiopian as the backbone. And then this equivariant features go through invariant field prediction and the equivariant field, uh, field prediction models to further process the uh, equivariant features. Here, these two modules are the main contribution of this work, which we'll explain in more details in the, few, in the next, few, next few slides. These equivalent features then go through the prediction heads for semantic segmentation, instant segmentation, and tracking. And their outputs, when combined together, is what we want for the 4D panoptic segmentation task. So what are the invariant and the equivalent field prediction modules? Let me first explain fields. A field in our context is basically just a mapping from the 3D Euclidean space R3 to V, which is some vector space, any vector space. So any dense prediction problems, they assign some properties to every point in the space. Therefore, we can regard them as a field prediction problem. And the fields are different. Some of the fields are scalars. For example, semantic class or the occupancy of a point, they can be represented as a single number for every point. So this um, scalars does not change when you rotate the field. Therefore, we call these scalar fields invariant. They are invariant scalar fields. And some other fields, the values are uh, the values in the V space are vectors. For example, velocity or the surface normal vectors. For these fields, the values in V will rotate together along with the field. Therefore, we call this field equivariant vector fields. 
And we will use this perspective to investigate the uh, 40 panoptic segmentation approaches. Here, a very important subtask in panoptic segmentation is instant segmentation, which is to identify individual objects. And in the literature, there are usually two main strategies to estimate the object center, which is a key step to segment the objects. The first strategy is called centerness prediction. So for every point, a centerness score is predicted. If the point is closer to the center of an object, the target centerness value is large. Otherwise, it is small. So such a centerness heat map is actually a invariant scalar field. The second strategy is called offset prediction. So for every point, a vector is predicted to point from this, uh, to, from this point to the center of an object. And we can see that such vectors will rotate when the point clouds are rotated. Therefore, they, this center offset map are equivariant vector fields. And we know that actually equivariant networks can be used to, to predict both invariant and equivariant targets. So here's a question. In the context of equivariant learning, is one strategy better than the other? So we conducted experiments to figure this out. We are using the semantic key data set for, uh, for experiment. It contains 22 driving sequences with about 43,000 frames in total. And it annotated 19 classes uh, where 11 of them are background and eight of them are objects. We'll be mostly discussing the uh, two of the official matrices, which is IOU of things, which measures the quality of object segmentation, and LSTQ, which measures the overall polypanoptic segmentation performance. Let's first look at the IOU of things. The performance is shown in this table. So we can see that in the first column, it's, it is without the equivariant model. We are not using equivariant features anywhere in the network. We can see that these two networks, actually, these two strategies actually perform very similar. And when we use the equivariant models, both of these strategies observe a considerable improvement, showing that the equivariance property is actually helpful in this task. And more importantly, we can observe that there we observe a much larger improvement when we are using the equivalent vector, equivalent vector field as a target. And it, sh it shows that such a strategy, predicting an equivalent vector field from the equivalent features actually brings more benefit from the equivalent models. We also analyze the overall performance of uh, and efficiency of our method. So here, the very left column, the gray one, is the non-equivariant baseline. And all the right columns are the equivariant models, but with different discretization of the SO2 group. Basically, you can see that it is uh, C2, C3, C4, and uh, C6. And we can see that our method boosts the performance while saving the computational paths. All these equivariant models improved the performance over the non-equivariant ones while consuming less memory and running in a faster with a with a faster running time. And also, our method for, uh, the performance of our method in the official leaderboard ranked the number one in the semantic kitty forty panoptic segmentation uh, leaderboard. So, here's the conclusion. We developed the first rotation equivariant LIDAR panoptic segmentation model, and we achieved better performance and lower with com lower computational cost than the non-equivariant baseline methods. For an equivariant model, surprisingly, we found that designing the targets as equivariant targets brings more benefit than as invariant ones. So now, uh, till now, I've presented the first three part of this presentation. They are all point cloud-based tasks. And the last task is an image-based task. What is the difference? So actually, they are very different. The challenge is that 
the input the input space for image based problems the images are R two, so they do not carry the SS three transformations in the input space. Therefore, the equivalent relationship, this commutativeness cannot be defined for such problems. Therefore, we cannot directly develop SS three equivalent models for the image based three perception tasks. However, we got some inspiration from the previous work. That is, we found that when the targets are invariant, are invariant, non-equivariant models' performance are actually closer to the equivariant models. Therefore, since we cannot directly develop the equivariant models for this monocular task, we're going to design the targets as invariant ones to encourage the network to explore the symmetry. And here it comes, the fourth part of this presentation, monocular 3D object detection with viewpoint invariant inter-object estimation. Here is an example from the new synthesis that we previously mentioned. Here, two vehicles are highlighted in the yellow bounding boxes. And you can see that when the vehicles, when this eagle vehicle is driving by, the two vehicles go through the five of the six cameras and their pose with respect to the Eagle vehicle also changed a lot as can be seen in the bird's eye view LiDAR image. However, if you look at the, actually the relative pose between these two vehicles remain constant. So here we want to discuss the benefit of uh, formulating the environment, uh, the, the inter-object relative pose targets. First is that they are viewpoint invariant, as we just discussed. Second, it is intuitive for vision. Here is uh, one of the frames take, taken out from this above um, video. It probably is pro pretty challenging for a person to inspect, to estimate the distance of this object from the camera. However, it is pretty straightforward to understand the rapid pulse between two, these two vehicles for the human's eye. And third, the relative pose between objects can provide additional geometric constraints for our estimation of the single, of the individual poses of the objects. And lastly, the relative pose between objects are, is actually valuable for understanding objects interaction, which I will uh, elaborate more in the next few slides. Before that, I'll give you a formal definition of the inter-object estimation targets. So it is pretty straightforward. The relative pose uh, from object I to object J is basically just the pose of object J in the reference frame of object I. And we also define a correlation mask. This is because the, we observed that we, the relative pose is easier to perceive from vision when the objects are close to each other. Therefore, we define the correlation mask as positive if the distance between two objects is under a threshold. And we only estimate the relative pose between the objects with positive correlation mask. Actually, there are some previous work in literature that share some similar idea. For example, uh, there are some work that already use the idea of relative pose in their method. However, their formulation is actually dependent on the camera parameters. In comparison, our formulation is viewpoint invariant. And this method only works for single view, uh, single front view camera, and they focus on the object individual object pose estimation, and only use the relative pose as an approach to improve the individual object pose estimation. In comparison, our method works for surround view cameras, and we not only do we focus on the um, individual poses, but also the inter object estimations, and we propose specific metrics to analyze them. Also, there's a recent work discussed the um, idea of viewpoint equivariance in object detection. And uh, it is using data augmentation by sampling more viewpoints to uh, let the network to learn more viewpoints. And this is contradicting our philosophy of reducing the sampling complexity by leveraging the symmetry. So here is the uh, here is the, our overall network architecture. 
So I will not, uh, still I'm not going to all the details in each of the small blocks. I will abstract them into this figure. Here, basically it, com it is uh, composed of an image encoder, several layers of object encoders, and an inter-object estimation module. The image encoder will take the surround view images uh, all together uh, as an input and uh, learn the and extract features from it. And then we have several layers of object decoder based on transformation uh, tra transformer architecture. It starts with a set of object queries and through the attention mechanism in the uh, transformers layers, these object queries attend the image features from the image decoder encoder and generally uh, generally estimates the uh, existence and position and properties of the 3D objects in the queries. And the inter-object estimation, here, we only show two layers of the object decoder, but in practice, there could be more, for example, five to six layers of the object decoder. And the inter-object estimation module is basically taking the object queries as input features and estimate the inter-object targets. And this is the main contribution of this work. So specifically, at each layer, the object queries with high classification scores, these uh, dark blue ones, they are more likely to be objects as estimated by the network. These queries are taken out to generate object pair features. And these features are then used to regress the inter-object targets through MLPs. Then the object pair features go through a refinement module and pa are passed uh, to the next layer. The next layer is similar, um, but only difference that it also takes input from, not only from the uh, 3D object queries from that layer, also, but also features of the object pairs from the last layer. At the end, the individual estimation of the object poses and the relative pose between the objects are sent together to a pose graph to optimize the final object's pose. And this pose graph is made differential, so uh, differentiable so that it can be integrated in the overall training pipeline. And we conduct experiments on the new synthesis set as we discussed before. It contains 40,000 uh, annotated uh, frames with six cameras covering the 360 degree view. The performance of the other official matrices are listed here in this table. Uh, but before we go into the details, let's first take a first glance. That is our method when integrating the inter-object estimation performs, outperforms the baseline in all the major matrices. But hold on, that's not the whole story. Uh, we further propose new metrics to evaluate the inter-object relative pose accuracy. So it is other than the individual object's pose. Here, we proposed mean average relative translation error, which is M-A-R-T-E, and also similarly for the orientation error, which is uh, M-A-R-O-E, and also a post error, M-A-R-P-E, by combining the translation error and the orientation error of the relative poses. And their definitions are similar to the uh, translation and orientation error for the individual objects, but it's just for relative process now. So here is the, the full view of the performance metrics table. The light blue ones, the last three columns, are for the inter-object estimation. Now we can analyze the, our performance with this table. First, our method achieved overall improved 3D object detection performance as shown in this NDS score. And then we achieved better in inter-object relative pulse estimation compared with the baseline as shown in this MARPE score and also this TENOE scores. Surprisingly, we also find that our method considerably improved the velocity and the attribute estimation here, the attributes are the, are the states of the objects, for example, including moving or parked or stopped. So the velocity and attribute estimation 
are mainly about the motion states of the objects. So why is that? Why would inter-object estimation help us estimating the velocity? It's not even in our formulation. So the reason is that um, like the objects that are close to each other actually usually share similar motion status. For example, a platoon of vehicles, they are very close to each other and they share very similar space. And similarly for the vehicles in the parking lot or parked on the sidewalk. So estimating the uh, rapid pulse between the close up objects actually helps the network to understand the object's interaction. Therefore, helps understand the object's behavior as shown in this velocity and attribute score. <clears throat> so in conclusion, we propose a viewpoint invariant interobject estimation task. And then we design a real interobject estimation module to realize it. We also propose several evaluation matrices for interobject estimation. Our approach improved the accuracy of object post and rapid post estimation. And surprisingly, we find that interobject estimation enhances the modeling of object interactions, benefiting the behavior analysis. So here is an overview of our what, what I just presented in this presentation. In the first part, the SO3 equivariant object registration, we, uh, the registration is conducted in the equivariant feature space and we realize initialization independent and correspondence free registration. In the second part, the efficient SE3 equivariant point convolutional network works in a quotient feature space, which largely reduces the computational cost and improves the practicality for equivalent point cloud learning. In the third part, the SE2 equivalent lidar sin segmentation views the segmentation problem as an equivariant field prediction problem. It improves the performance with reduced computation. And through this task, we show the value of equivariance in complicated and realistic 3D perception tasks. Lastly, monocular 3D object detection with viewpoint invariance we proposed a viewpoint invariant inter-object relative post estimation task, and our model improved the detection accuracy and behavior <laughs> understanding. Overall, through all this work, we show that equivariant models can be made efficient and easy to use. And exploiting the inductive bias of symmetry helps reduce the computation and improve the performance in large-scale 3D perception problems. However, broader symmetries are yet to be explored. And here, I would like to discuss three future directions. First is homography equivariance for image-based 3D perception. We already discussed that the, we cannot directly use S33 equivariance in image-based 3D problems because the input space simply does not carry S33 uh, transformations. However, an SC3 transform when projected to an image may be approximated by a homography transform. For example, in the figure shown on the right, the SC3 transform of the camera when projecting an image can be visualized as a homography transform visualized by the uh, book, uh, by the book plane. So I think it is potentially beneficial to explore the, this equation that is to use the homography transform in the image space to approximate SC3 covariance to bring more reliable image-based 3D perception. The second direction is adaptive equivariance. Our real-world sensor data are imperfect. They're subject to noise, sampling, sparsity, and visibility change. Therefore, these imperfections can actually break the symmetry in the input. In this case, I think, we may use models with adaptive equivariance, for example, soft equivariance or local equivariance, and they may work better in this real world case. The third direction is equivariant implicit representation. Implicit representations have been applied in a wide range of perception problems. For example, 3D scene reconstruction, 3D semantic inference, semantic, synthetic data generation, and mapping and tracking. The implicit representations work by responding to querying coordinates. However, querying coordinates are sensitive to the reference frame affected by all the observers and objects posts. 
On the other hand, we know that the symmetry, the idea of symmetry implies that the information should be independent of the chosen frames. Therefore, I believe it is a potential direction to explore the benefits of symmetry to build more robust implicit representations. And this concludes the technical part of my uh, oral defense. Thank you all. This is the end of my presentation. I'd love to take questions.